Dan's out of the yeah. hospital. Thank we you. are so thankful. For all your prayers and everything, I, I do appreciate it. I thank you all. Well, we're very grateful that you're here. Me too. <laughs> we're going to keep praying we'll for you, too. Who else has a blessing today? Nobody else has a blessing? Yes, Barbara. Hey, Amen. That's awesome. Oh, no. Okay. Oh, yeah. 31st, so we'll all be praying, keeping you in prayer, too. Amen. Yes? What? Yeah, so I dropped a spring into a fishing pool. I dropped it. I don't know if it's going to go there or something. And I was lucky enough to send it anyways the floor and shoot it out the exhaust instead. Oh my, okay. Well, we're grateful that you're still here. <laughs> oh my goodness. Stay Yes. Anybody else? Yes. We have a grandchildren for the weekend. Woohoo! All those teenage boys and my girls, we take the boys back today, but I just love them. They're a blessing. It's, what a nice... Nice... Oh yeah. Boys. So so your cupboards are now cleaned out they and your freezer's all the nice and cleaned room. out. Yep. Awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. Anybody else? I'm glad to have everybody here today. I was thinking as we were singing that last song, my my kids like to swing and lose all their inhibitions. Last summer it was, my sister's mean to me. My sister's mean to me. I love my sister. My sister's mean. And I was listening to another little one the other day going, this is awesome. This is awesome. Because she just learned how to swing. I'm yours, Lord. Everything I've got, everything I am, everything I'm not. You know, when we sing, that's our chance to have total abandonment, right? Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O oh, my soul, I worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. Your in love and you're slow to anger your name is great and your heart is kind for all your goodness I'll keep on singing ten thousand reasons for my heart to find bless the Lord oh my soul oh my soul worship his holy name sing what name Your holy name. 
And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending, 10,000 years and forever. Beautiful Lord, wonderful Savior, I know for sure, all of my days are held in your hand, crafted into your perfect plan. You gently call me into your presence, guiding me by your Holy Spirit, teach me, dear Lord, to live all my life. As we walk each day with Jesus, he's right there feeling what we're feeling. Happiness, thankfulness, joyfulness, frustration, sadness. He's feeling it all right with us. And when we give that to him, he can take control of those things and help us when we're not feeling like we would like to be feeling. Amen? Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Mold me and make me This is what 
change my heart to God. May I be like you. You are. Jesus, that's our prayer this morning. Change our heart and make us be more like you. We know that you're the only one that can do it. So we lift up this time to you and we lift up ourselves to you and we ask you to do a miracle in every situation. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Good morning, everyone. This morning, before we start lighting this candle, I want you to think about something that's very important. I want everybody to really think about what I'm going to say. I didn't understand that. My phone is talking to me. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, what I'm about to say is about thinking about Soldiers and missionaries. Why do we have soldiers? Why do we have missionaries? Think about that for a minute. I don't think we really stop and think about why we have this. When, if we look in the Bible, I could read many verses in the Bible, but I'm not going to do that today. But what I'm going to do is explain to you what I feel the reason why we need military and we need missionaries. I believe we need them because it's a spiritual war. We're fighting the devil. We're fighting evil every day. We need help to fight these bad things that are happening to us in our lives. We need the Lord. We need the military. And we need the missionaries because we want to not only spread the word, but we want to absorb the goodness and move the evil away. And the only way we could do that, we need help. We can't do it on our own. So we need the military. We need the military more than we know. And we need missionaries to spread the gospel. But that's the reason why I feel like we need to think about these things. It's very important. Because not only do we want to praise our military, but we want to praise our missionaries as well for the work that they do to protect us, to love us, and to be with us. Now, if I can figure out how to work this thing. Ah. This wick is not wanting to light. Okay. So as I light this candle, of course, my phone wants to talk to me. I, I printed down this prayer that I had this morning. Um, that I wanted to share with everybody. So let us pray. Dear God, we lift up our soldiers and our missionaries to you, asking for your divine protection and guidance. Please watch over them as they carry out their duties with courage and compassion. Surround them with your love and peace and grant them strength in times of difficulty. May they feel your presence and know that they are supported by prayers from around the world. Amen. I hope this prayer brings you peace, knowing that you have the military and you have missionaries looking out for us to protect us from the evils of this world. Amen. Amen. I was hoping that would work from here. All right, announcements. Uh, seniors, it's our, finally our time uh, sharing games fun for people over 60. Uh, you can let Roger know uh, that you will be coming or not. And Tuesday, it's... Tomorrow. 
Oh yeah, he, he, he yeah, you heard him. Uh, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. normally. And slow. Bible studies, uh, Wednesdays at 6.45 p.m. and on Sunday mornings at 9.30 a.m. And then next week, we had Paul's greatest greets the church, but it's worded differently in the bulletins. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I'm sorry. Okay, there's one of the things that, oh, the Bible study on Wednesday. Yeah. Zoom only. Yeah, Zoom only up, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I should have thought of that. All right, May 11th, Women's Brunch at 10.30 a.m. You can talk to Ruthie about that and find out any information you need. Uh, she can fill you in more. So. Uh, KelseyCommunityChurch.org is up and running and, and working completely fine. We checked it out many a times and it's so awesome. Whoop! Now you go twice. Wow. Uh, book borrowing and DVDs in the hallway. Uh, ask Diane or Jeannie for information on, on what you need to do and so forth. Uh, also, blessing table in the kitchen where you may find giveaway to someone in need. Watertown Senior Center, a senior center uh, is in Watertown, and I did change the address. It's on 245 Polk Street. That, that way there you kind of know a little more what, what, what area to go to to get there. Uh, and you'll be able to get to it real quick and easy. It's 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. It's a Marcy building. All right, you're up. <laughs> What you got in your hand? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, if I could have uh, two ushers come forward, please. <clears throat> you know, I've been doing this for a few years. You know what? It doesn't get old to me. <laughs> I kind of look forward to this every week, believe it or not. I'm basically asking you for money. <laughs> but we have needs here in the church that we need to be able to, to, to overcome too. And I thank God for what my sister done a couple of months back. Because that has reestablished us in the community. And I really appreciate that. It really has become a blessing. So, let's pray. May today be all that we need to be. May the peace of God and the freshness of the Holy Spirit rest in our thoughts, rule in our dreams, and conquer our fears. God, may we drink from the cup of your salvation, rejoice in the company of your saints, and delight in the sacrifice of your praise. Thank you for this new day, and please guide us and lead us today. Give us the courage to face all the challenges that come our way. Amen. Pray.
Good morning. Thanks. I heard that loud and clear. I didn't hear the rest of the people, but I heard you. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Yes, I would love for it to be a sunny day, but it's not. It's been raining a lot. But as Dan said, we're going to have some really nice green grass when it finally stops. So everything that God made was good. Every creation he made, at the end of it, he said, this is good. So this is good today as well. So by this time, everyone knows the deal. They know that Pastor uh, Milton um, had to go home again because he had death in his family again. So um, we, I don't know if he's still in the air. I don't know if he touched down. But let's go to the Lord in prayer so we can pray for him. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this day. Because everything you made, Lord, is good. Lord, I pray for each and every one here this morning, Lord, that if they have discomfort, Lord, you will give them comfort. If they are agitated, Lord, you'll give them peace. If they're in pain, Lord, I pray, Lord, you will restore their health. And I pray for Pastor Milton, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you are giving him safe travel, that he'll touch down safely. I pray, Lord, that he would be a comfort to his family and bring them some sort of peace during this grief. And I pray, Lord, as, you, as he is ministering to them, Lord, you are ministering to him. And I ask all these prayers in your son Jesus' name. Amen. So, I've said this before. You probably tell her, hear me saying it. But I went to late ministry school for five years with two other people in this church. It was really tough because they was cramming a semester that usually lasts two and a half months and six weeks. So we had a lot of tests. We had to write a lot of papers. We had to do a lot of mock messages. And we did a lot of traveling. Because it was never at the same place. We had to go where the pastor was that was giving the class. So we was all over the place. It was hard. It took five years. But I'm so glad that I did it. Because it taught me so much. And one of the things that it taught me was to be, um, they told us, those of you who are in the position to give a message. You have to give a, be ready for a message in season and out of season. In season, it's not going to be a problem for you. You know what's going to happen. The pastor might say, Ruthie, I'm going away this weekend. Can you give the message this Sunday? And I was, if I say yes, I know to prepare. I know to pray and ask God to give me a message. I know to meditate on that message. I know what's going to happen. That's easy. But when it's out of season, he told me and the rest of us, it's going to be harder. Because you might walk through that door and someone meet you and say, the pastor took six as soon as he walked in the church. Can you give the message? And you're like, what? So you had to be ready at all times to be able to give a message. Now, how do I do that? From the moment I walk out that church, I'll be open to God and a message from him. I keep a little pad by my bed with a pen. So when I, even when I dream, I get messages from God. I used to try to ignore it and say, oh, I remember, I write it down in the morning. The next morning, I wouldn't remember it. So I, and I think he really did that on purpose because he meant for me to write it down right then and there. Now I, I jot it down. I jot something here. I jot something there. And, and then when the time come, I put it all together. So I'm never unprepared because I always have a message with it. Because I know the next person up is going to be Roger, and the person after Roger is going to be Dan, and then I'll be next. So I'm already always prepared. So when I got the call from Jeannie, I wasn't really upset or, or stressing out about it because I knew exactly what I wanted to say. So we know what to do. So we have to be prepared in season, out of season. So what do we do when life catches us unaware, when life, life is out of season for us? And we know what's going to go on. That's not going to be a problem. But what happens when you have a, a, a normal day, going about your business, and you get that phone call that your son has been in a terrible accident? Or your mother just had a heart attack? When life catches unaware, what do we do? Because life, 
It's not going to be like a message. It's not going to give us a chance to sit down, pray on it, read our Bible. It's just going to happen. Well, I have a few things that I've noticed over the years that, and I have even noticed it in this church, that I would like to talk about what we do. First of all, you make life easier on yourself by accepting from others. Whether there's prayers, whether there's a, a, a covered dish coming to your house, whether there is a ride to the hospital. Because sometimes we can become so prideful that we feel like, I don't want people to know that I'm, I need this. I'm supposed to be strong. I'm supposed to have this, this all together. I should have a, a savings account that I can just draw from. First come pride, then come destruction. The pride come first, and destruction follow behind it. How does that happen? Well, Proverbs 16, 18 through 19 said, pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Better to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spores with the proud. We don't want to be with the lowly. We don't want to be with the people that never prepared. So we're just, when someone say, let me take you to the hospital. No, I'm fine, I got it. Let me bring you a meal. No, I'm fine, I got it. Now, if you don't really need it, then that's fine. So that's not a problem. But it's when you do need, that's when you have the pride. I remember when I was in this church, of course, and I, um, I was a deacon, and I was going through a divorce, and I hardly had any food in my home. And at the time, Reverend Henry had the church, and his wife Christine and I was good friends. We'd walk on the nature trail and spend a lot of time together, and I, maybe she figured it out, maybe I told her. But the church was facing that way at the time, and we came through those doors, and he would, he would be on the steps. And when we would go down the steps, he would shake our hand and chit chat a little bit. But when I shook his hand, he held it and he said, wait for a minute, see me after, after church today. So I waited, thinking something, you know, I did something wrong, of course. So then he said, come back here around about 5.30 or 6 o'clock. It was winter time. It was going to be dark then. He said, and let's go to the food pantry. And we had a great food pantry. We had eggs, we had bread, we had meats, we had a refrigerator. And the first, I was, first thing I wanted to say was, no, no, I, I'm, no I, I don't need it. Why? Because my husband was in the military. He also was a pastor. I never had a money problem. Then all of a sudden, I'm going through a divorce. There's only one income coming in. Now, I do have a money problem. I did have a money problem then. But I stayed. I came back at 6 o'clock. He brought me in. I went through the food pantry. My son was out with his friends. It was Javi's father. He was 16. He came home, and he opened up the cabinet thinking that he'd probably get a jar of peanut butter and a, and a couple slices of bread. And he'd go, wow, look at all this food. First come pride. That was the destruction. Because I was so prideful that I was willing to let him be hungry because I didn't want people to know how bad things really were. And that's something that we have to stop doing God sent us here for us to help each other get through the bad times. What does the Bible say about pride? It said, God hates pride. Proverbs 16, 5 says, The Lord detests all the proud of heart. They will not go unpunished. And I was like, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to get punished because I'm embarrassed? He's not going to so much punish me, but I'm going to punish myself. Because I'm going to miss out on something that could have helped me through that time. When you allow your pride to get in the way of a blessing, then that's not good. So let's keep that in mind, not to be so prideful. I say now, there's no shame in my game. If I need something, I let people know. The, the Bible has many examples of prideful people, including kings, prophets, and others. King Saul, Nimrod, Satan himself. Because when we are prideful, we are exalting ourselves. We are, are, patting our, we are kind of putting ourselves before others. We don't want people to know that I'm like this person who always have a need, who's always going to a food pantry. In fact, someone told me this, and I, and I, and I realized how true it is now. They said, so that was years back, so you're going to start a food pantry. I said, yes, we really need a food pantry. And they said, but you know what? 
The food will go, the food will expire before anyone in the church take anything out of the food pantry, even if they need it. I know a few people do here take it, and I'm glad. They'll go to another church food pantry before they go to their own, because they don't want the people in here to see them taking food out. <laughs> On Tuesday, I go and I go, I don't feel like going to Walmart. I'm going to see if they got a can of tomato sauce. I'm making pasta tonight, and I'll bring it back next Sunday or whatever. So, we think about Satan. Satan was prideful. He thought that he was equal to God or, or better. What happened to him? He got kicked out of heaven. It's not good to be prideful. Second thing, we realize that God was with us during the good times. We should realize that God was with us during the good times. He would certainly be with us during the bad times. C.S. Lewis said, God whispers to us in our pleasure. Speak in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. He shouts in our pain. We hear him the most in our pain. He's with us at all times. So what we do, we realize that and say, and, and, and instead of panicking, we, we think, because first thing you do, you're probably going to panic. Oh my God, I just got a call from the, um, the police, my son is, and we're trying to get there. And we have to calm down and realize that if he's with up me during the bad times, he's going to be with me at all times good or bad. It's like getting a loan from a bank. When I got a loan from, from the, my bank, a Mary Cuit for a drum, to get my car, I made sure I make that payment every month on time. So when I decide to get my grandson a car, I probably go back to that bank and, and get a loan. They'll look at my records and say, you know what? She always paid on time. I don't see a problem giving her a loan. That's what we have to do with God. We look back on our past. We look back and see how he brought us through everything that we had to go through. We didn't have to go through it by ourselves. And sometimes he helped us by sending people. He's not going to come down and drive us to the hospital. He's going to send someone else to do that. So we, we look back at how he got us through our tough times. We look back on his records with us. He's in good standing on my records, and I hope he's in good standing on yours. I have a few favorite scriptures in the Bible. One is Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans for you, plans to prosper you, plans not to hurt you, but plans to give you a hope and a future. That's Jeremiah 29, 11. That's what God is telling us. That's what he tells me all the time. When I want to go ahead of him, he says, Ruthie, slow down. I know the plans for you. And I, do, I used to say, well, if he knows the plans for me, nothing I do is, is not going to work out because he's going to have his way. I said, well, his way is always the best way. He don't mean that we can't have goals, but the ultimate decision is, is his. So, we, the third thing is we pray for peace in the situation. John 16, 33, these things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulations, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Now be of good cheer don't mean that, oh my God, I'm so glad that, they, that my car broke down. I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that, that I'm having these problems. It's, it's, uh, it's not that type of cheer. It's just saying that God is telling us that this is not going to, I'm not going to allow this to hurt you. You might have to get a ride with someone else, but I'm going to make a plan. And your phone ring, and someone says, Ruth, you know what, I don't feel like um, driving by myself um, tomorrow to school. You, you want to ride with me and just park your car? My car's in the shop. Oh my gosh, thanks, Sandy. I was just wondering how I was going to get to work. He has everything planned out. But I love this scripture. When I used to read that, I used to just, it just sent chills. The fact that he was saying, I've overcome the world. He came here as man and God, didn't he? He overcame the world. He had gone through what we have gone through. In the God of Gethsemane, it was no joke for him. In the God of Gethsemane, he was stressed. He didn't want to go through 
the next thing he had to go through. But he said, not my will, but your will be done, Father. So he told us that I walked the path for you. I've died for you on the cross. I will get you through this. I will walk with you down that path. And sometimes there will only be one set of footsteps in, on, on that path because he's carrying us. The next thing we should do is acceptance. Sometimes that is so hard to do more than anything else, is accepting what has happened to you. I think about Walt. We were at the Tuesday luncheon, and I was helping him to get in his car. And this was the man that was my mentor. And he had, when I was going through that bad time financially, I would say to him, I'm so embarrassed. I'm so tired of people always bringing me pans of lasagna and pretending that they had some left over, a whole pan. I said, I know they brought it just for me. And he said, Ruthie, I said, I want to be the one to help someone sometime. He said, your day will come and you will help others. And remember that. Right now, you, are, you need the help. So let people be there to help you. Because the day going to come that someone else is going to need the help and you'll be there to help them. But now here's this man that I was helping to get in the car. And I knew he was embarrassed. And I knew he was a little prideful. And he was, he was walking so slow, holding on to the hood of the car, getting to the, the um, door, pulling the door open. And he stopped and he hit on the, on, the, on the door of the car. And I go, are you OK? And he said, I remember when I used We were very close. He said, I remember when I used to run, and now I can barely walk. He said, it's so hard for me to accept. And I thought of what the Bible says, that one day others would lead us. We're not always going to be young. We're not always going to uh, have this great health that we once had. But as long as we keep putting one foot before the other. And I said to him, I said, but, but, you, but at least um, while you're getting around. So he got in the car, and I know he was thinking about the days when he just walked out to the car. If someone followed him, it was just to talk to him, not to help him get in the car. I know in the end, he did accept what was happening. It was hard for me to accept when I broke my femur. It was hard for me to accept the fact that one moment I'm on the porch with Fran, we laughing, talking. I come in to make a cup of tea for her and myself, and I'm putting spaghetti in the bowl. We had dinner, and I look around and say, where's the lid? I said, man, I left it on the table. Turn around, the lid was under my foot. Because we was talking, I never heard it fall. Stepped out and stepped on it. And just that quickly, my life has changed. I fell and said to my orthopedic, I said, I know what you're doing. You don't want to tell me how bad things are. What's going on? I know I should not be limping still. One leg is shorter than the other. I can tell. And he said, yes, it's going to be shorter than the other. He said, but there are shoes for that. There's insert for that. And in my mind, I didn't say it to him, but I was screaming, no, I don't want to insert. I want to be like I was before. I used to walk around younger people in Walmart because they're walking slow. I walk so fast. Now I'm limping fast because I cannot straighten up like I did before. And he said, you know, at least you're walking. Some people never leave the rehabilitation place. They can, they can never heal. You're up and you're walking. And when it rains like today, you're going to be in pain. When it's cold outside because you've got a steel rod in your leg, it's going to hurt. But you're walking. You haven't got an infection there yet, but you're walking. But it was so hard for me to accept how quickly my life has changed. And I think I was feeling a little bit smug. Because when I had to go in for an appointment, the lady called me to, to, to get my medical record. And she said, um, how many times have you been hospitalized? I said, three times. She said, for, for what reason? I said, I gave birth to three children. You're 70 and, and never been in hospital, but just when you gave birth? I said, yeah, I know. I said, I think that's amazing. And, the, and about a week later, here I'm at Carthage Hospital. And they had to take me to uh, um, Claston Hepburn for um, emergency um, femur. 
broke in the worst break is stage four, and I'm on stage four. So sometimes it's hard for us to accept when we start losing our health. We just feel like it was gonna go on the way we were forever. So the next thing is acceptance. When you get that diagnosis of, of, of a bad illness, a cancer, or anything like that, you go through stages. One of them, of course, is shock, but the last one is acceptance. You learn to accept this is the way it is. Do I don't still pray that one day I'll be able to walk normally? Of course I do. But I accept the fact that I'm just happy to be alive and still take care of my grandson. Because I was so afraid that I would have to go into a home and I was worried about Javius. So I learned to accept. Psalm 4610 says, be still and know that I am God. Someone said to me, be still and see him be active. So I'm going to leave you with this. It's going to be a fairly short message. When we're going through trials and tribulation, don't be prideful. Review God's record with you. Pray for peace and accept that you're still alive. It was hard, right, Dan? It was hard, but you're here with us this morning. And God still has a plan for you, and we're still praying for you. But sometimes when we accept what is happening, we have more peace. Betty Cooper said to me one time, I came here, I was 43, and she was 53, and she'd never been married. And um, she said, you know, being an old maid is like drowning. Once you stop fighting the water, everything just comes peaceful. You learn, you learn other things to do, gardening and stuff like that. With me, I have accepted this is the way I'm, I'm going to be, at least for right now, and I have more of a peace about it. I don't walk as fast as I used to, and I used to wonder why I was always so tired, and, and he told me because you're carrying that leg a lot. You, you carry it, that's why you, you're, you're tired. So, let's go to, to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you. I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be before your people, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for giving us the ability to still get around. You're giving us good health. It might not be like it was before, Lord, but we are grateful. I pray that you be with us as we leave here today. We know that you go with us everywhere we go. You never leave us nor forsake us. And I ask all these prayers in your son Jesus' name. Amen. You know, uh, this week is also the week for communion. So if we prepare our hearts for that, <coughs> let me dress the table, Todd. And if I can have two ushers come forward, please. Thank you, You know, the institution of communion, it's been around a while. Anybody I plant, get, get hazard to guess about how long? How about over 2,000 years? It's an institution that's been there a long time. Some facts about the, the Last Supper. And this is kind of, in my opinion, important. It happened during the Passover. Now, the Passover goes all the way back to Egypt, where God was, had passed on some pretty nasty uh, plagues onto the Egyptian people. And 
the Jewish people were instructed to paint their doorposts with the blood of the Lamb. And that that would be a sign for the angel to pass over that house, which is where the word comes from, Passover. Now that lamb was sacrificed, was part of the meal for the Seder the next day. But that lamb was also the blood which allowed the angel to pass over that, that dwelling. So with that in mind, that sacrificial lamb was extremely, extremely important. Jesus shared this communion with his 12 disciples. Not the only ones. There was, there's been some said as many as 150 to 200 there. But the main one thrust was to his disciples. The bread and the wine symbolizes Jesus' body and blood. And it was the institution of what we now call communion. And over those 2,000 plus years, this has been maintained by many churches. So it said that Jesus washed his disciples' feet. That Jesus showed that he was a servant. And he did it to the very end. And Judas the Seraphim betrayed him right there at that supper. And then later on, Peter's denial. The painting by Leonardo da Vinci captures the climatic moment. And it's not a fresco, it's actually a picture. I believe it was not a mistake that God chose this time of year. And by the way, anybody know what happened last month? Huh? That's right. Passover ended on the 30th of last month. But God did not it cho chose this choose this time because He could the Christ could have come to Jerusalem any time. But no, He came at that particular moment, that particular time, and that particular place, which was Jerusalem. The sacrificial lamb needed to be in the right place, the right time, and everything had to come together just right. Jesus was that sacrifice. So with that, let's go back to the institution. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke the bread. He said, take and eat. This is my body. He took a cup. A little tight in there. And then he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood, the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Afterwards, I say Hammond was dismissed. This morning, however, there was a decision made earlier that we would not do that. So all I'm going to do now is close our service with a prayer. So let's pray. <laughs> Lord Jesus, I thank you for this opportunity that you've given us. And I pray, Lord, that as we move on from here, that you will bless every single person here. Remind them constantly of their stand with you. That you may witness to others. That you may serve others. And be what you're meant to be in Christ. I thank you for this day. In spite of its raininess. Amen.